Okay, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm very, very excited to once again <laughs> talk some more Malzan, and today I'll be going over uh, my review for Erickson's most recent novel, and that of course is The God Is Not Willing, uh, book one in the Witness trilogy. Um, and fair warning, for those of you who haven't um, finished the main series, all 10 books, um, there will be some main series spoilers because this novel is set about 10 years after the main events of Book of the Fallen. Um, it's almost inevitable, even when talking on, about a non-spoiler review, um, there will be aspects of the main series. Um, there will be spoilers for the main series in even my non-spoiler portion. Uh, but before you click off, what I will say about it, um, if you're making your way through the 10, 10 main books, let me know where you're at as far as your progress goes, how you're liking it in the comments down below. Um, and then uh, I will say also um, that in regards to this book, if you're making your way through the main series, you do have yet another installment to look forward to. Um, I really, really enjoyed this uh, book by Erickson. Um, very much uh, puts on display his writing, um, you know, a continuation of his writing and themes and philosophies that he um, goes in depth with in the main series. It's a continuation of that. They're still there. If you like Erickson's writing in Book of the Fallen, you're going to really, really enjoy this book. So that's my splurge for people who have not finished Book of the Fallen yet. Um, but moving forward, this will follow my standard review reviews um, as far as the first portion. I'll talk non-spoilers for those of you who have not read the book yet. Um, you can still get my uh, general thoughts and feelings on it. I know I touched on it a little bit. It is going to be a positive review. Shocking. It's a male's and book written by Steven Erickson. I know. Uh, very shocking that I would enjoy it. Um, but then the second portion, and I'll make it very obvious when I'm doing this transition, I'll go more in depth um, and really get into the, the actual details of the story as well as going a little bit more in depth on exploring themes and stuff like that because I'm able to actually pull details from the story. Uh, so it'll be more uh, spoiler related. Um, but like I said, that transition will be obvious. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the non-spoiler portion. Um, and if you watched my, I think I touched on it in my book haul video or maybe it was my TBR video. I talked a little bit about this book cause I had just started it um, and it still holds true. The first page of this book is, I think, my favorite first page of any fantasy novel I've ever written, uh, or not ever written, ever read. Um, maybe that's a little bit far of a right reach, but nothing else comes to mind, and it really does a great job of setting the tone, setting the stage um, of what is to come. It really, I mean, he sets the bar very high right from the get-go. And the story as a whole doesn't disappoint. So I do want to take the time to actually read that first page uh, because it's so epic and great. Uh, I loved it personally. Um, if you guys have started the book already, let me know. D did you feel the same way? Am I crazy? <laughs> um, but I do want to read it just on camera because of how great it is. Uh, like I said, it really sets the stage for um, what's to come. So let's get into that. Um, so here we go. What to make of this? The Lord of Death is dead. The sire of war rests silent in a broken crypt. Light and dark have fled into shadow, and shadow dreams of sunlight. Houses lie abandoned, heralds cry out unheard. Masons sift through numb hands, mistresses wait alone in the night. Queens weep and kings stumble. All the world is in flux. Truce dying with every breath spent and every word uttered. <laughs> and that's just the first paragraph. <laughs> We got a lot more to go. An old woman walks a corridor, lighting candles one by one, but the hollow wind steals every flame in her wake. But now I see arrayed before me a new field of battle, greeting dawn with heavy silence. Soon, in the fraying gloom, the darkness shakes apart to reveal two armies facing one another. Banners flap like wings, the ranks plume and steam. The rising sun makes a strewn treasure of weapons and armor. Then rises a single figure between the foe's spire of flesh and obdurate will, iron-boned yet shattered of visage. He is no one's champion, yet everyone's god. He is the warrior's red blessing, yet the lover's sweet kiss. He is witness to every corpse and the maker of children. 
He is history's gilded prow, rearing fierce through the spume, yet dwells at ease in the space between Barrow and men here. He is heavy footfall and he is feather touch, could stare and fleeting glance, cold stare and fleeting glance. For him, all is surrendered. For him, all is sacrificed. In his name, nations fall. In his names, gods will kneel. If empires burn, blame him not, nor again in the moment the lover turns away. To witness is to begin to see, to see is to begin to know, to know is to recoil. Yet he stands fast, unarmed, unarmored against this future. And I do know him. He is the unwilling God, the helpless God, the slayer of all and of none. The foes do not move. The sun unfurls its golden light across the surface of the world. Will this day, will this be a day of war? Let us see. <laughs> so, I mean, that just really puts on display Erickson's writing. He's, he can be so elegant at times when he wants to. Um, and like I said, if that doesn't set the stage, I, I mean, that does a tremendous job. Um, let me know, like I said, what you guys think of that opening page. Am I being, am I too high in my praise? Is it really one of the best first pages I've ever read um, or you've ever read? Let me know down below. Um, but yeah, let's get into the actual meat and potatoes of the review, if you will. Um, like I've already talked about, um, this, it, this book almost feels like a mini book of the fallen. Um, I say many because one, it's not as long, but two, it's not as grand in its scope yet. And granted, this is the first book in a trilogy. So whether he expands that, I mean, it's Erickson, so I wouldn't doubt that by any means. If there's one author who loves the grand and giant epicness, if you will, of a fantasy series, it's Erickson. So maybe he'll expand on that. But um, like I said, it's a, it's a bit shorter it's about the half of length of your typical book the fallen book um and the scope is a little smaller you're not in the heads of like 100 characters like you are in garden of the moon where he really just kind of um almost throws you to the wolves and you know lets you sink or swim if you will um there's really just a few perspectives in this one um and you also one of the things that what what makes this book really feel like home as far as males and books go is um i'm sure everyone will love this if you have read it you probably love it as well but we get back to males and marines and their perspectives and erickson's writing as far as marines go and a soldier archetype i think is second to none at least for me it is he had such a unique take on um soldiers and obviously he's focusing on marines specifically um but it's such a unique take the like 95% of the time it's this like comedic exchanges nothing's too serious um it's over the top like comedy almost um but then that makes that's like 95% of the time but then Erickson also doesn't shy away from the 5% where they've just witnessed or even done something um horrific he still those characters that are like 95 percent of the time all jokes like um witty banter do have moments of self-reflection that are so so thought-provoking and feel real and compassionate so erickson no one writes a soldier better than erickson in my opinion it's so unique like i said with that mix of um comedic banter that underlines everything they say but then the also at the same time that doesn't take away or make the compassionate moments feel unreal it actually makes it feel all the more real almost as if you know the comedy is um almost their way of coping with the horrors they have to to face every day as a Malazan Marine. Uh, so just really, really powerful stuff. Um, but like I said, just you feel right at home um, with the Marines in this book. It feels very much like it does in the Book of the Fallen. Um, and that brings me to my next point. Uh, another just really cool thing about this story is that 
So it takes place, from what I can gather, about 10 years after the uh, Book of the Fallen leaves off. So obviously those events are now almost like um, like the modern, they're like myths, but it was only 10 years ago. So you have some like living leg legends, which we see with Spindle, who obviously was a bridge burner. He's the one that wears like the hair shirt. Um, so even though it's only been t 10 years, the events were so like legendary um, that it's now like interwoven, like, oh, surely that didn't happen that way, you know? And another thing that I found was cool too, rather than like cursing Hood's name, it's Iskar's name because obviously um, Hood's now dead. So Iskar's kind of taken over that realm, um, but he's not, we learned that Whiskey Jack isn't sitting on the throne of that um, of the dead like Hood was. He's more of just like a gatekeeper, so it leaves some questions as to like, like these souls of the people have died. Like what exactly is going on there? Um, and we do get a little exploration of that, uh, which I won't go into for the sake of spoilers, like I mentioned. Um, but we, yeah, we get to see a little bit of the consequences of that in this book, which is really cool. Um, and like I said, we also have. Um, everything is kind of turned like from like history and fact into like this uh their legends the bridge bridge burners are legends and some people are skeptical of like were they really that great did those things actually happen that way uh surely that's not how it could have gone down that's just uh hyperbole um so we get a lot of that and exploration of that um so yeah just really really cool uh fundamentally at its core um it scratches the itch of like where Book of the Fallen left off, kind of as a reader thinking, where do they go from here? This story really kind of fleshes out, you know, what the world looks like after those events. So that was cool. Um, one thing going into it, I totally misunderstood um, before I picked this book up, uh, the perspective it was going to be from. <laughs> I thought it was going to be almost entirely from Carson Orlong's point of view. That's actually not the case at all. Uh, Carson Orlong serves as the backdrop um, as this unwilling god who uh, it's rumored he's like just living outside of Darugistan. Um, he basically doesn't want to be bothered, um, you know, kind of rejects all his followers as religions have popped up around him. So that's obviously where we get the title, The God is Not Willing. So yeah, rather than his perspective, you don't get that at all, actually. Um, he's just serving as the backdrop to the story, um, and it really explores a lot of the consequences of Carsa Orlong's early life, um, as we know from the main series, and, you know, the consequences of that, you know, the, the people he left in his wake, if you will, deals with um, some of his children and... Um, all that stuff it's very fascinating um but basically yeah it's he, he doesn't want to be bothered he's in darugistan don't bother him <laughs> so uh which isn't surprising that's very much to his character but that's where we get the title the god is not willing as i said earlier too um this continues on some of the themes and um yeah some of the themes that were explored in book the fallen one of the major undercurrents here, uh, some of the major undercurrents are themes of compassion. Obviously, that's the biggest one we see in most of the Book of the Fallen. That's If I had to pick one theme out of the many explored in Book of the Fallen, it would be compassion, especially the crippled God is, you know, the ultimate reflection of that. Um, so we get more of that. It's, you know, definitely uh, there, definitely present. Um, but then we also see Erickson explore um, themes of innocence, um, you know, especially from a child's perspective, uh, child innocence and what it means to grow into adulthood and leaving that innocence behind, if you will. Um, so that was really intriguing. And that's one of my biggest things as to why these Malazan and Erickson's writing um, are some of my favorites is because especially in fantasy i know there it's out there but um i love erickson's exploration of themes and philosophies in his books to me it scratches an itch that 
pretty much every other fantasy book that I've read. Granted, I'm not you know super well versed on everything and all things fantasy, um, but from what I've read, Erickson does the best job about actually flushing out and exploring um, themes and makes you self reflect um, as well as explore philosophies, why things are the way they are, why the world is the way it is. Um, so that is something that. Um, I went when I picked up the main series wasn't expect that wasn't on my radar at all I just wanted to read you know cool stories um, and that's why I have such a fond appreciation of Erickson's writing is because um, it showed me that even in fantasy and even when you're enjoying such a great intriguing story for its own sake it is also really really nice to get these themes and philosophies underlying those things that if you want them and you're looking for them you can pick them up and it makes you kind of think and self-reflect which i um find really enjoyable that's one of the reasons why erickson is my favorite author so to wrap up the non-spoiler portion of the review like i said it feels like a mini book of the falling fallen not quite as epic and grand um but at its core, very much feels like a Malazan story. Um, it scratches all the itches, <laughs> if you will, uh, that Book of the Fallen does in the sense of its themes um, and its character work um, best put on display by uh, Malazan's writing of Marines. And just like I, I keep going back to that character archetype is to me just a genius. The, 95% mixture of comedy, but then the 5%, like this at its core, um, like compassionate human being, what it means to care for, you know, people outside of just, you know, yourself or just your family, um, which I really, really appreciate. Uh, but like I said, the, the marine writing in this is tremendous and great. So if you enjoyed Book of the Fallen, you'll definitely enjoy this book. I think I need to give it some more time So for me away from the book to see how I feel it ranks as far as if I threw it into the main 10, where would it kind of uh, line up? I just finished it, so I think recency bias is playing into it a little bit. But to me, it feels higher on the on the higher end of that. If I were to rank them all, um, definitely not at the very, very top, but it does feel like um, it'd be up there. So yeah, hope you enjoyed my non-spoiler portion. Um, if you've already finished the book, don't go anywhere because I'm about to jump into the spoiler portion. Okay, now once again, jumping into the spoiler portion, um, let's get into it. And obviously if you've read it, you'll know, but there's really two main storylines at play here. We have Rant, um, who is the son of Karsa Orlong, and then the other storyline being uh, just being following the main uh, company of Malazan Marines. Um, but Rant's story is so, so tragic. Uh, as I talked about a little bit in my non-spoiler portion, the main theme Erickson um, really tackles here, here is like the innocence of a child and the, the absolute tragedy of that innocence being stolen away. Um, is just heart-wrenching, absolutely heart-wrenching. Erickson does a tremendous job of depicting that um, and kind of wrestling with that throughout the entire book. Um, there's actually like the one of the moments, one of the moments in the actual book that really kind of shakes you to your core is, let me see if I can find it, give me one moment here. Yeah, so, um, well, before I get into that, let's actually just... <laughs> go over a little bit more of Rant's story. So Rant is the son, of course, of Orlong. Uh, we learn that uh, back, way back in House of Chains, when um, Cursa originally raided the village of Silver Lake, uh, he obviously was under, he took blood oil, which basically sends you into like a feverish like rage to the Teblor. That's temporary. However, um, he assaults um, a woman, and when you do that, with blood under the influence of uh, blood oil as a tedlor, it transfers permanently to the woman you've assaulted. Terrible, terrible tragedy. But out of that, Rant is born. Um, and Teblors, Erickson states, are very slow to mature. So we learn that he's just turning 15 in the events of this book around that age, but really, especially how he was raised, 
he think he's more like maturity level of a very young child. So it, uh, he's depicted as thinking the, um, you know, kids in the village who are throwing stones at him are his friends. Um, and in reality, it's because he's so this like half Teblor person who obviously we know human nature. If you're different, ten, people are going to tend to reject you and even attack you, as we see here. Um, and then not only that is his friends throwing stones at him. His mom is cursed with blood oil. Um, she's basically um, entirely mad and crazy. So she can't really raise rant as you know a child should be raised um it sounds like he pretty much fends for himself um she gives him a place to stay almost but like i said doesn't really go into town with him doesn't you know provide for a traditional like parental guardian should <laughs> so uh that really um inhibits his emotional and mental development like I said, a really tragic story. It's then finally, uh, because blood oil drives you crazy, his mother gets to the point where she can no longer help himself, herself, assaults Rant, um, and she, even under the curse of the blood oil, recognizes that, threatens to kill herself if Rand, uh, Rant doesn't run away. So he obviously does. Um, she forces him out, but even then under the the fever or the badness of the blood oil, she recognizes that it's just a matter of time, even if she didn't do this to him, um, it was just a matter of time before the townspeople actually turn on Rant entirely um, and kill him. So it's almost this for your own good sort of thing. But remember, we're dealing with essentially a young child, especially emotionally, so he doesn't understand anything that's going on or the events that occurred so he runs away ends up trying to swim silver lake which let me pull up the map i initially reading this i was like oh it's just a little lake no <laughs> silver lake is pretty big you can see hopefully those are two separate towns so he tries to swim across that um, and obviously doesn't make it because it's winter at this point and gets halfway and basically essentially starts drowning. We then meet uh, Damisk, who is a hunter who is uh, hunting out uh, near the lake. He goes and saves him, uh, pulls him ashore. We learn that Damisk was actually one of the made major slave um, hunters, if you will. He was assigned with going out and actually collecting Teblor people to be slaves back when that was um, still around before Carsa kind of led that slave revolt, um, which freed all those people in the main series. Um, so we, so Damisk was a horrible guy, right? But he does this act of kindness. He saves, um, I almost called him Carsa. He saves Rant from drowning. And then with that, they have um, a lot of conversations and it's mostly Damisk talking to Rant, because especially at this point, Rant is so underdeveloped emotionally. He doesn't really understand or know how to like have a normal conversation with people. So a lot of it is Damisk um, almost giving him this wisdom. The it sounds like Damisk has now led a life of self-reflection on all the horrible things he's done. He's trying to make up for them, as futile as that may be at this point. Um, but he imparts a lot of wisdom to Rant, explains to him um, what his mother did was horrible and uh, unforgivable in a sense, but that was the blood oil, not you know, really Rant's mom acting under her own uh, conditions. And actually it's, uh, he explains to Rant that it's a sh uh, show of immense love and compassion that she was able to withhold uh, from doing that for so long while well, under blood oil um, took tremendous courage and strength he explains uh, so rant fortunately is able to kind of partition the two events separately um, understand that you know his mom in the end did love him but was just almost cursed uh, to do this thing that was almost inevitable from the explanation damas gives 
So, Damisk then tries to, or explains to Rant, okay, you can't go back to Silver Lake because um, the, peop- the townspeople will eventually kill you. So he's going to guide Rant to the Teblor, which is no small task for Damis because Damis explains with all the atrocities he's committed, if he were to get captured by the Teblor, it would most certainly mean his death. Um, so yeah, they're traveling in the woods. Damisk is imparting all this wisdom on Rant, making him help to understand and mature him a little, a little bit. Rant starts coming out of his shell more, starts um, actually conversing with Damisk. Uh, so we get some of that emotional development that was so lacking for Rant. But then Damisk discovers that the Samadhi, and forgive that pronunciation if it's wrong, are out in the woods um, and they basically kill anyone who isn't um, who isn't Samadhi themselves, but they're also friends with the Teblor. So Damisk knows, especially if they find out who he is, that he's most certainly going to be killed by them. But he tells Rant that because they're friends of the Teblor, um, if they find you by yourself, they may spare you and may even lead you to the Teblor. So Damisk and him at that point split up. Um, and they go their separate ways. Um, at that point, we run into Gower, who is Lord of the Black Jack. What are Jack? Jack are uh, wolf divers. Um, so they uh, are a human that can split into six wolves. Um, and the Samadhi actually use Rant as bait when they kind of corral him, Damis sense uh, having left. Um, so the Samadhi, who are eternal uh enemies of the jack. Um, Their rite of passage is to hunt and kill a jack, um, so they're always on the lookout for that. So they try and use Rant as bait. Doesn't go so well for them. Uh, Gower, the Lord of the Black Jack, um, attacks the Samadhi and also tries to attack um, Rant. Him being there gets almost caught in the crossfire, but it turns out that Rant may, even though he is underdeveloped emotionally, he still has the blood of Curse Orlong in him and is a great warrior. So he ends up actually killing five of the six um, uh, jack divers of Gower. When there's only one left, it uh, the wolf turns back into Gower in his human form and um, Rant being still somewhat innocent, like I said, he's losing a lot of that spares him um, and then starts conversing with him um, and they end up building quite a friendship uh, they then run into uh, Gower's brother it turns out and I can't pronounce his name um, but once again Rant uh, they're headed towards a conflict and Rant just like punches him in his face and even as a 15 year old Jacks are these great warriors um, knocks him out so his fighting prowess is very much on display here Damisk eventually does find and regroup back with now um, Rant, the two Jacks, Gower, and Niglan, I want to say is his name potentially, but like I said, that pronunciation is bad Um, (laughs) and maybe completely wrong. So Damisk finds Rant um, once again uh, with uh, the two Jacks, and they continue to make their way towards the Teblor um, where they run into... um, Rant's half-sister, Delas, um, who obviously is another one of the children of Karsa, who's also with another one of her sisters, Toneth, um, I believe her name is. And once again, forgive me for these pronunciations, but... Um, so yeah, they meet up. They explain to Rant that when they find out who Damask is, that he's for sure going to be killed. <laughs> uh, Rand obviously doesn't, uh, isn't standing for that. Um, and this is really where we find out how much of a child Rant actually is emotionally. When her, his sisters do realize what had happened to them, um, they under, they say, okay, we're not going to bring you to challenge uh, our current war leader, but we're still going to take Damis there and they're still going to kill Damis. So Rant has this internal struggle and it's almost his first sign of 
um, almost being it's his first sign I think Carcel would call it his first sign of chains so, because he's faced with this decision where he's forced to make um, this decision and neither of the outcomes is good for him and that's once another uh, yet another example of kind of his loss of innocence moving towards adulthood um, and some of the the realities he needs to face in adulthood so um, he's basically faced with okay you can either um, surrender Damask and Damask gets executed for crimes that even Damask is telling Rant listen this is you know my due punishment um, the one the few good things I've done don't negate all of the bad that I've committed so he accepts it but um, Rant really struggles with that but then the alternative is, if Rant stands up and fights, his sisters now, um, having sworn fealty to him after they realized, one, that he was a son of Carsa Orlong, and two, that he was uh, this horrific thing that has happened to him um, as a child, um, they understand how innocent he is and was, and it is still kind of, so they swear, fe swear fealty to him. But in doing so, they explain that, listen, if you stand up to fight for Damask, we'll have to fight on your behalf and all of us die. So, Rant obviously chooses the lesser of two evils. Like I said, one of the realities of adulthood, if you will. Um, one of the realities of him fully losing his innocence. So he elects to give up his first friend. Um, which is, his story is so, so tragic throughout this book, and this is just yet another example of it. So that's kind of the, the struggles that Rant goes through. Um, but then he does have a lot of Karsa in him in that Karsa has an uncanny knack for, even though he doesn't want people to follow him, people somehow attach themselves to him. And Rant is very much the same way, having now both his sisters are tied to him um the jack are tied to him damask was tied to him rant never asked for this um, but like i say it's almost like being chained against your will which kind of explains why carsa has um, basically started to live a, the life of a hermit because carsa fundamentally understands that if you're kind of living uh, life intertwined and all the politicking of humanity and all that you're you may not be physically in chains but you are bound to certain things so it's a really great case uh, character study between kind of rant and carsa they have a lot of similarities but at their core um, are somewhat fundamentally different carsa was um, obviously his defining moment or what he's driven most by is um, breaking, you know, the chains of people or, or uh, freeing, you know, slaves and uh, d abolishing slavery and all that. Rant fundamentally is driven by this stealing of innocence, which we see, um, which is really exemplified between his conversation with um, Warbitch at the end. But yeah, just this theme of loss of innocence, how tragic that is, how everyone goes through it. That's Rant's motivating factor. Um, and he's even described as he um, empties all of his anger out from his heart, which Carsa seems to be driven or seem to have been driven by a lot of anger. Rant is very different in that sense. He is uh, described as emptying it all. Um, so he's got this like uh, almost cold um, understanding of the world that he's quickly had to realize as his innocence was taken from him. So. Uh, of the two storylines, the, the two being kind of Rant and the Marines, as much as I love the Marines and all the, the comedy that brings, um, I did really enjoy Rant's and the exploration of, of loss of innocence was really powerful for me. But then uh, let's talk a little bit about the Marines because, I mean, how can you not? The uh, main theme Erickson seems to deal with here, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, is really compassion, what it means to be compassionate and empathetic towards your, uh, you know, a fellow human being or, or fellow being in general, in the, this case, the, the book of Malazan um, or the Malazan world. 
and he does such a great job as i mentioned like the because they're so comedic and witty bantering all the time when they do have these moments of realization um it's all the more heartfelt and powerful and uh their story they're sent to silver lake they don't really know why but they're marines so they understand they don't question it they understand they must be needed there um so they go to silver lake not really knowing what they're getting into um they ultimately uh fight off the wilders and the tablor um who they tragically slay the Sunid, who don't stop trying to siege the city even when they've laid out munitions all around it. So they just basically get slaughtered. Um, but once again, Marines at their core, they represent compassion and empathy. So um, on the battlefield after the Sunid had been slayed, uh, I think it was Spindle who goes out there and a wounded soldier uh, whispers, or a wounded Tablor whispers, uh, you know, burn the town because for the Sunni, that's where they were enslaved before they were freed. Um, so this town represents the evil of slavery and all that. So the Marines, without question, even though the Empire not might not want them to, they burn the town to the ground um, completely, like almost no questions asked. Um, so yeah, they burn it to the ground, but ultimately it's futile because... Um, we know now know that the uh, floodwaters from this like great um, ice wall that was put up from Amtos Felak from the uh, jagged is now melting because uh, Amtos Felak is no more. Um, so it's melting and it's gonna wipe away pretty much the northern half of this continent. It sounds like, um, which really puts into perspective how futile war is. Like what are we really doing here um, fighting and killing each other when nature can just come in and, and sweep you all aside. So they regroup at another town, the Marines do, which is being laid siege to by another group of Teblor when the um, ice wall cracks and breaks or whatever, and they see the floodplain uh, coming down and they realize the Teblors aren't on their horses to um, siege the city but rather they're running from the water. Um, and at that point, the Marines all put their weapons down. Um, they actually make a funnel to funnel the Teblor um, into this, behind the city walls to try and save them. And they, have, um, they just happen to have barges because it's a lake city. Um, so they funnel them and get them all onto the barges. Once again, showing that compassion of, um, you know, these people they were about to kill in war, they see the... Um, floodwaters coming they realize how meaningless that is um, and that these are people just trying to escape uh, a horrific fate um, so they do what marines do and they put others before themselves um, and get as many of these tableau onto the barges as they can um, they're ultimately uh, mostly successful although many people obviously still die um, which you know is still horrible the uh main core of marines that were following they all managed to survive this um, and then the book finally concludes with they're on this new shoreline looking out um, at the flood waters at all the the bodies um, that have now drifted ashore um, and ohms i believe it was uh, states how important it is to bear witness um, which is another major theme that we see a lot in the main series um, because it teaches and shows us to be compassionate. If the Marines don't wit bear witness to it, no one will. Um, and once again, just a really great um, exploration of compassion and empathy. Oh, and before I do that, I do just want to read, um, like I said, the importance to bear witness that Marines, it's at their core, um, one of their fundamental beliefs. Um, so this is just a great quote. To bear witness, perhaps because to do otherwise would not allow the, not only be an act of a coward, it would also be an act of disrespect. And to not just the bodies of Malazan Marines below, the bodies of friends and comrades lost, but all others as well, especially the children, and there were so many children. What sort of person could turn away from such a, a scene, shutting off all feeling, all humanity? It was a ritual, 
he eventually decided, but a ritual in the proper sense of the term, not quite a rite of passage that would be too ghastly a price from any one place to the next, but something that simply needed to be done. You do not turn away. You do not rush back to your own life, your own world. Tell yourself that your family, your loved ones are all that matters. We were... Were they indeed all that mattered, then in your world, not one person who's not you or your family would give a flying fuck about you or them. And in a world like that, why, it might well be better to be dead than alive. So once again, that really drives home the point of that compassion and empathy that is at the Marine's core. Um, And another great line here, this is actually those quotes from before the chapters that Erickson does. This really shows you need at your core to be compassionate to be a Malazan Marine. Um, And this is the heading of chapter 20. All the, it just says, do you give a shit? And then below that, it's a first question asked of a potential Marine recruit. So um, to join the Marines, you need to give a shit, if you will. Um, So yeah, I just really thought that those two things really drove home that point. Um, It's... One of I love Erickson's exploration of uh, compassion, empathy, um, what it means to be a compassionate human being um, that we see a lot of explored in Book of the Fallen. And like I said, obviously, just by those two quotes alone, um, he really, really does a good job exploring it further in The God is Not Willing. So that wraps up my in-depth uh, review of God, The God is Not Willing. If you've made it to the end, uh, let's see, if you've made it to the end of the video, let me know uh, your reading plans for the upcoming month or two as far as it relates to Malazan. Are you going to read some Malazan books? Um, have you read The God is Not Willing? Um, and what are your plans? So yeah, without any further ado, I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one.